CSF otteria and labyrinthine disturbance, so that's some practical aspect of it. Here we've got a, a wonderful photograph of the cerebellar pontine angle region. Here we've got the eighth cranial nerve, the uh, vestibular cochlea, and look how close the seventh is to it. So this is my area for this tumor, which is a, an acoustic neuroma. The patients with acoustic neuromas present with uh, deafness, of course there are many, many causes of deafness, and at least in this country and we have a, a bad habit of just putting up with it. It's often associated with tinnitus, and you might say, oh, many ears disease, but eventually as the tumor gets bigger, the patient starts to become dizzy. Um, I've seen huge acoustics in the past. Now, uh, it, the syndrome is so well known that everyone goes in the scanner when they're only about one centimeter size, whereas the big old ones were, you know, fist size. Um, okay, the cerebellar pontine angle, very, very important for neurosurgeons to know about because of the proximity of the seventh, the eighth, and indeed the ninth nerve. And where is V1? V, V, V above a five. Where's five? It's fine, gone. On the left. On the left. I've lost it. Um, six. Oh. No? No, it's been cut off. Yeah. Okay. I always recognize the fifth nerve when I'm down in there. Okay. Remember, therefore, that the eighth cranial nerve is vestibular and cochlear. It has two completely different parts to it. The, the, in terms of hearing, uh, the audiogram, I'm slightly deaf in one ear from murdering presence in the past, uh, but I don't have any problems with my vestibular apparatus unless I go on a, a, a ship for a long time. I'm absolutely hopeless on a, on a boat. And in the Royal Navy, I was as sick as a dog when I was in the uh, minesweepers and the, as, a, as, a, as a naval doctor. Everyone thought that was funny. Um, vestibular and cochlear. A little bit about a sad thing called brain death. Because brain death testing goes through a lot of what we've talked about so far this evening. And one of the tests we do is actually to put uh, cold water in here. And when we put cold water with a syringe being squirting the stuff in, a big syringe, constantly over four or five minutes putting icy cold water in there, what, what happens? Does anybody know? Can you tell me? Pardon? Nystagmus. Correct. Why? So he said nystagmus. That would be the normal response. Why? Or how? What's the physics from physiology? Well, the answer is that, that in the semicircular canals, in which we've got three, we've got fluid, the endolymph. And when we cool down those semicircular canals indirectly by squirting in ice cold water against the tympanic membrane, that's enough, we set up a convection current of the fluid and the convection current of the fluid disturbs the little hair cells that then disturb the vestibular uh, nerve endings which goes into the brain stem which is connected to eye movement so we get nystagmus and that's the normal response that we're looking for as one of the brain stem death tests okay that brings up of course the other thing to do is to get your your uh, child or partner and, and run around and do this long enough, and when you stop, you've got nystagmus. And it's exactly the same thing. All you're doing is disturbing your endolymph. In fact, I feel a bit dizzy. Uh, and if you looked at me, I would have nystagmus. Okay. <coughs> Electronystagmography, that's a heck of a mouthful, is actually done in ENT clinics to look at vestibular function. That what they do is they put, I've been in this, they put you in a chair, like an electric chair, and then they whiz you around, and they've got um, electrodes attached to your eyes and the globes of your eyes, and you're actually then inducing nystagmus, and they can look at it uh, physiologically. Electronystagmography. Tinnitus, deafness, eventually ataxia, eventually facial weakness because of the seventh nerve. That's rare nowadays. Trigeminal sensory loss, oh, I, 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 I've forgotten actually, and this you're never going to see nowadays, I think, although my own chief, uh, Valentine Logue, um, the son of the King's Speech, uh, as I told you, I think, last time, he said I used to see hydrocephalus uh, hope, because I used to go to the mental uh, institutions where people were being incarcerated with hydrocephalus pre-scan days, and actually they turn out poor people to have an acoustic neuroma. 
Can you imagine being in a, a mental hospital all your life, well, half your life, purely because you had a, a benign but large tumour? Nine in ten. Now, nine, when we test GAG, and the response of, of, of uh, putting a little stick in the back of the throat, the sensory to the GAG reflex is glossopharyngeal in, vagus motor out. Can you actually just dis distinguish between these two in, in clinical testing? Yes, you can. What you say to the patient is, open your mouth like that. I'm just going to touch you. I wouldn't use this so much. I might have a, a nurse holding the tongue down with a spatula, and I would get a little orange stick and just touch that there and touch it there. Asking the patient, obviously beforehand, can you tell me if it feels the same on both sides, as well as looking at the reaction of the gang? Okay. This is a particularly useful thing in the sad case of motor neuron disease. So motor neuron disease is particularly li liable to pick off the nuclei of 9 and 10 in my experience before it goes on. And of course the direct clinical consequence of that is that patients at the end stage of motor neuron disease are unable to get the food in the right passage and they die of asphyxia from uh, inhalation pneumonia of food. They're inhaling the food down the wrong way because they've lost the swallow gag reflex. Okay. Uh, nine and ten. Nine, uh, nine in, ten out. The other thing about people with vagus uh, problems is they get a bovine voice. They sound apparently a bit like a cow. <coughs> uh, and they all, <coughs> we ask them to call. <laughs> Because they, 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 they have lost the laryngeal musculature as well, which is also vagal. So they get a change in their voice quality. Okay. <coughs> 11 and 12. Um, again, show me how you test 11. Come on, you're at the front. We're at five past eight, so I'm <clears throat> so we're going to do 11. Okay. Um, so can you show your shoulders for me? Good, good man. Do you want to do it behind? Yeah. Show your shoulders for me. And don't let me push them down. Okay. That's fine. If you want to turn to face me, um, can you look to your left? And don't let me push you away. And look to your right. And don't let me push you up. So he's 10. Yeah. And the other thing that I do, can you speed it the neck again? Just push your head forwards against my hand. Come on, push your head forwards and then look at both sternocleidomastoids and mastoids as well. So there's two ways to do it. Turn this way hard, this way, okay, and there it is, good. And this way, and there it is, good. So that's the way to test 11. 12 is easy, pop your tongue out, and if you've got a hyperglossal lesion, what happens? Yeah, which way does the deviation happen? So I've got a left hypoglossal to the right, he said. Towards this side. Correct, that's right. So the strong, if I've got a left hypoglossal, my left side of my tongue uh, wastes. Again, you see this in motor neuron disease, fasciculation happening in the tongue, often bilaterally. A very important sign of, of a cranial nerve. You might call it like lower motor neuron, in a sense it is, but the, new, the, the neurons are the neurons of the hypoglossal nucleus that are going. The tongue starts to fasciculate and become wasted. That's usually both sides. On the other hand, if it's a, a hypoglossal region on one side, let's say it's the left, the tongue goes out to the left and the left side is wasted. The, um, thank you. There it is there. So here we've got the, the tongue being asked to push out and deviate to the, to the left hand side because the patient's got wasting and the strong muscle is pushing it out there. Uh, I think the next slide, ah, it does. What sort of things might cause a 12th lesion or 11 and 12? And it's usually things around the base of the skull here. And I uh, actually once put a, a piece of, uh, I think it was a pipe cleaner, an old fashioned, as in pipe, smoking pipe, and put uh, this red pipe cleaner to show where the hypoglossal canal was. And if you start to get tumors that invade the base of the skull, often ear, nose, and throat cancers can do that. They pick off 11 and 12. Uh, sometimes even 9 and 10, base of skull tumours. 
So we've, we're nearly there now. We must test, we must know our neurology, anatomy, and the clinical pathology. Now, this man, I don't think, he's, a, a, he's on the outside of New College, Oxford, um, a gargoyle as it's called, uh, the water comes over his head and spouts down into the courtyard below. I don't think he's got trigeminal neuralgia, but um, I just hope you don't feel like this at the end of my, my talk, because that would be rather sad. Okay, thanks.